Uh, I'm going to uh, begin with some terminology. Uh, I don't want to say that I'm interacting with or critiquing two kingdoms theology because I believe the historic reform position requires two kingdom theology. Uh, all, all the reformed are, would be advocates of two kingdom thinking, two kingdom theology. But what kind of two kingdom theology are you talking about? What do you mean? How, how do you define it? Um, a, a popular uh, configuration of two kingdom theology has come out of um, the modern reformed world is probably uh, most notably um, connected to Westminster West and Escondido um, figures like Michael Horton and David Van Drunen, uh, people like that, are advocates of a particular, a peculiar form of two kingdoms theology, which is frequently called R2K, radical two kingdom theology. So radical two kingdom theology, R2K, is the position that I want to critique tonight. I want to uh, uh, wind up posing a series of five questions to the advocates of the R2K position, but I'm speaking from a two kingdom position, but I want to define terms first. So uh, when, when you say two kingdoms theology, one of the first questions that ought to occur to us is, okay, two kingdoms, how many kings? Okay. How many kings are there? Well, there's only one king, right? our Lord Jesus Christ. If there's one king, then ultimately, we're not talking about a kingdom over here and a kingdom over there, and there's no traffic uh, between them. If there's one king, then these kingdoms are somehow united in their king. So uh, I, what I want to do is begin by summarizing what this is uh, a summary of the position that I'm critiquing, and then I'm going to... Uh, hit the pause button and um, do a few trippy illustrations. It's, it's, it's gonna seem like I changed the subject and I didn't. <laughs> or, all right, I'm, going, I'm doing this on purpose. It's gonna seem like a weird five minutes there. And then I'm gonna come back and apply what I've um, been saying to this issue. So here's my summary of what I take to be a theological novelty, a theological novelty in the, in the Reformed tradition and this is what I mean by the R2K position, and this is the position I'm interacting with. This would be uh, my take of what an R2K advocate would say. God rules all human institutions and endeavors, but he does so in two fundamentally different ways. He rules in his spiritual kingdom, the church, as a redeemer, and he rules the civil realm as creator and sustainer. These two kingdoms have different ends and functions and therefore must be ruled differently. The spiritual kingdom is governed by special revelation, the Bible, and the other kingdom is governed by natural law. All right, so that's, that's my summary of that position in a nutshell. God rules all human institutions and endeavors, but he does so in two fundamentally different ways. He rules in the spiritual kingdom of the church as a redeemer, and he rules the civil realm as creator and sustainer. These two kingdoms have different ends and functions, and therefore must be ruled differently. The spiritual kingdom is governed by special revelation, the Bible, and the other kingdom is governed by natural law. All right, so they would say, okay, there's one king, but th this one king has committed himself to govern in the church in one way, and in the church, we have access to the Bible, and we can quote Bible verses, and we can say the Bible's authoritative. But when you go out into the public square and you say, thou shalt not commit murder, all right, when we um, take a stand in the pro-life battle, for example, and someone says to me, if someone were to say to me, why do you say, uh, why do you say that we must not take human life and abortion? Why, why do you say that abortion should be against the law? And I would say, because God said to Moses on Mount Sinai that you, we can't do that. Right? I would appeal to special revelation. God said to Moses. And in order to emphasize his point, he set the top of the mountain on fire. <laughs> now, w that's not good enough, you say? <laughs> that's not sufficient? Well, what the problem is I'm, I'm going into the civil realm, I'm going into the public square, and I'm appealing to special revelation. And the two kingdom people say you can't do that because they don't accept uh, they don't accept your uh, Bible, 
And on top of that, God doesn't want, God doesn't want you applying the Bible out there in that realm because he doesn't want that kingdom to be governed in that way. He wants us to quote the Bible and another Bible inside the church, but he doesn't want us doing that in the public sphere. So that's the uh, R2K position. I take this to be a novelty. I want to briefly define what I think an accurate understanding of two king, the two-kingdom approach is. I take this to be a novelty because according to the Reformers, the spiritual kingdom was that of the heart, the conscience, the inner man, while the other kingdom was external and visible, church included. Okay, so the, um, the R2K position takes the state, civil sphere over here, and the church over here, and draws a, uh, a line this way. Okay, what the reformers did is they took all of human existence and they drew the line this way. In every, everywhere, everywhere you go, there are physical things. The pulpit is as physical as the judge's bench is. The pulpit is a physical thing. The church is a physical thing. The people in, in the church are, have a physical manifestation. And the reformers would say that's all part of the external kingdom. The internal kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, is the heart, the conscience, the, the invisible realities of man. And that's true across the board. The magistrate, the judge, the, the parliament, um, the ministers, everybody has an internal, invisible conscience that relates to God. So um, in Calvin's Institutes, for example, in 31915, 31915, uh, Calvin would include the church as part of the, vis- the external church as part of the visible kingdom and the external state as part of the visible kingdom and the internal heart condition of the king as, as it being part of the spiritual realm. So in other words, the modern form of it divides church and state while the reformational form of it divided inner and outer, invisible and visible. Okay, so that's a, it's this way versus this way. And um, and I, I think you can see that there's more than a little, I think you, sh- you should be able to intuit that there uh, might well be more than a little bit of dependence on a misunderstanding of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Well, there's a separation of church and state, and we're just going to go down, we're just going to follow down that groove that was established for us, and we're going to say church over here, state over there. This makes thing, a many, there are many things about this that are very convenient for conservative Christians who don't want to collide with the world. If you don't want to collide with the world, there are a lot of things about this that are, that are pretty convenient. So that's the setup. Uh, two kingdoms is church and state, and the, the, I think the historic reform position, two kingdoms are external and internal, visible, visible human society and invisible human society. All right, so hit the pause button and let me um, take a brief, uh, a brief foray into some weird stuff and then I'll come back. <laughs> we have, why, do, why do we make this mistake? We have a perennial temptation to think that we have de- defined, de- we, we believe that we have explained something when we've only described it. We think we believe that we've explained something when we've only described it, and we think that if we give something a name or if we put some labels on it, that that somehow accomplishes a separation. Like if we make distinctions, we think that these distinctions actually accomplish a division. All right, so here, here are the examples. And these distinctions can be very simple, but it can also get you in, uh, in very heady territory. So there's a, a simple distinction between height, the, take this lectern, the height of the lectern, the breadth of the lectern, and the depth of the lectern, the three dimensions, height, breadth, and depth. Those distinctions are simple enough for a child to understand. Okay? Now if I say height, breadth, and depth, can I separate them? No, I can distinguish them. I can distinguish them easily, but I can't separate them. I, it just... If, for example, if I removed all the height from this lectern, I do not have a very, very flat lectern. I have no lectern. If I just, all the height, if all the height disappeared, I don't have a skinny lectern on the floor. I don't have a footprint of the lectern on the floor. I have no lectern. You know, if I remove just one element, I've removed the whole thing. 
So I can take something that's easily distinguishable, the height of a thing, and I can't, I have, for the life of me, I can't separate them. I can't separate height from breadth, right? I, nobody can, but it's easy to distinguish. We think, um, and this is the perennial temptation of smart people. Uh, smart people are the ones ruining the world. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a perennial temptation that they have. They think that, they, they think that they've um, explained something or captured it in a bottle when they've, all, they're, all they've done is given definitions or descriptions to it. They've not explained anything. So if I say, uh, for example, um, why, why does this fall? When I let go of it, why does this fall? You've all been to school. You'd say gravity. i say, okay, very good. What's gravity? Things falling. <laughs> okay, now I've got, I'm going to illustrate, the, um, I've got a, a personal hypothesis, and that is that there's a, there's, um, a thing, the creature's called watch fairies. <laughs> and whenever someone lets go of a watch, then the nearest watch fairy grabs it and hauls it toward the, the biggest large object near to it and does so at 9.8 meters per second squared. This is my hypothesis. All right? Confirmed, right? <laughs> You say, no, 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 it's nothing about it is confirmed because I don't see your fairies. I don't see your gravity. <laughs> gravity, the, what, gravity is just the name we give to conceal our helplessness. We don't know why things stick together. We don't know why we don't float off. We don't know why one mass can act on another mass at a distance with no cables between them. Well, we do know, Jesus. Right? All things hold together in Colossians 1. Everything holds together in, uh, in Jesus. I remember in a physics class years ago at the university, protons and neutrons uh, are all packed together in the nucleus of an atom. The neutrons have no charge. Protons all have a, uh, po are all positively charged. What do positive charges do? They repel. So what holds all these protons together? My instructor said. He said, the strong force. We call it the strong force. I said, oh. <laughs> you don't know. You, you obviously don't know. And you're just, and we say, why does it, you know, daddy, why does it rain? Well, high pressure areas and low pressure areas. You're not explaining. You're just describing. Okay. You're not explaining. You're just describing. Now, what does that have to do? I'm going to bring this, reel it back in and bring it back to this issue. When we say there are two kingdoms, we somehow think that we've exercised lordship over them. We've described, we've put definitions on them, and we somehow think that we've had the authority to separate them. We think we can detach them. But the king doesn't detach, right? The things I learned in Sunday school are things that I ought to remember when I'm a magistrate 30 years later. The things I learned about justice from my mother who was a confessing Christian who was teaching me. I don't, I don't have to go through life saying, oh, oh, where did I learn that? I can't, uh, uh, did I learn this from natural law or did I learn this in Sunday school? I can't remember. Don't steal. Is that Kant or is that Moses? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way, all right? It just simply doesn't work that way. So the, the mistake that the, the R2K um, folks are making is they think that by saying there's two kingdoms and here's one of them on the blackboard and here's another kingdom and here's on the blackboard and God is sovereign over both of them but he only talks to people in this one through this megaphone and he talks to us over here in this one and ta-da and I'd say but what authority do we have for making this distinction? Well, we can, I think we can obviously make the distinction, but what makes us think that we can uh, say that there's a separation because of that distinction? So I'm going to go on and make my own distinction here for a minute. I think that there's, I think there's an obvious difference between the civil realm and the ecclesiastical realm. There's an obvious difference. I'm not disputing that part of it. Um, I would want to go on to say... Um, add one other government. I, I believe that under God, that, well, there's four governments, four governments. Under God, fundamentally, there's self-government, self-control, 
It's the fruit of the Spirit. Converted men and women exhibit self-control. They, can, they are set free from their sins. They're forgiven for their sins. They are liberated from their passions, and they can exercise self-government. And that's the foundation of every form of political, civil, or ecclesiastical liberty. If people are not forgiven, if people are not experiencing forgiveness, if they're not walking in forgiveness, if they are not cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then there is no way that you can keep a collection of people like that from being slaves. They will be slaves. Slaves to sin have never, uh, slaves to sin have never built free institutions. Slaves don't do that. All right? in, order, uh, in order for slaves to build a free institution, they have to be liberated by a savior, taken out of the land of Egypt, have Pharaoh's army destroyed, and they've got to spend 40 years having certain principles of liberty drilled into them. All right? the, the, the slaves don't say, I know what, I'm yearning to be free. Slaves don't do that. Slaves are in bondage to sin, and that's the thing that makes all, every form of slavery uh, stick. And And incidentally, this is why um, our society is being degraded as uh, rapidly as it is. G.K. Chesterton said the first and free love, he was speaking of free love, he said this is the first and most obvious bribe that can be offered to a slave. The first and most obvious bribe that can be offered to a slave. When you talk to leftists about liberty, They want you to have liberty. They say, we want you to have liberty. But the liberty they want you to have is the kind of liberty that could be exercised in a six-by-eight prison cell. You can can smoke pot in a prison cell. You can be sexually immoral in a prison cell. Uh, The kind of liberty that we want is the liberty to marry, move wherever in the country you want, start up a small business, keep the money you earn. That's genuine. The the kind of liberty you can't exercise in a six-by-eight prison cell. So um, self-control is foundational to everything else, self-government, and that means we need a lot of gospel preachers preaching, uh, just preaching the gospel for the salvation of sinners. We, we need people to be converted. Um, uh, the second president of the United States, speaking of our Constitution in America, said our Constitution, and this is, these words are very true and they're uh, frightening. Okay. He said, our Constitution presupposes a moral and a religious people. He said, it is wholly unfit for any other. Our Constitution presupposes a moral and a religious people. It is wholly unfit for any other because it's a Constitution for a free people, and you can't have slaves governing themselves as though they were free people. You can't have slaves to sin functioning as though they were not slaves to sin. So self-government is the first foundational uh, governance um, for all other forms of government. Then the three forms of government in the Bible that God has given to man that were formed directly by God are family government, church government, and civil government. Those are the three governments that God has formed. And notice, like the R2K people, I'm distinguishing them. God established family government in the Garden of Eden, He brought the woman to the man, gave the woman to the man, and said, uh, here she is. And he, uh, and and God established it as a pattern down through the end of the world that a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That is a divinely ordained, divinely established government. And parliament, Congress, can't make that go away any more than they can pass a law saying water is going to now flow uphill. It, It won't. Sorry. So family government is established directly by God. Church government is established directly by God. Jesus Christ conquered death. He was crucified on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He was given universal power and dominion, and he gave gifts to men, um, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So Jesus Christ from heaven gave that gave his people on earth church government. That's, that was his gift to us. He gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, church office. So that government is established by God as a separate, distinct, not created by the government, civil government, not created by man, but created by God directly. And then in Romans 13, 
uh, we are told that no authority, and here it's speaking of civil authority, no authority exists except that which is established by God, and the, the civil authority bears the sword, and he does not bear the sword for nothing. Um, he punishes the wrongdoer, he rewards the righteous. It's talking about civil government directly established by God. Now, there are other governments that are established by us, the board of a Christian school, or the, the steering committee for your ham radio club, or the, you know, we can, we can establish a society and we, can, we have the authority to come up with the bylaws and the governance of this, um, this particular entity. But the three entities that were established directly by God and cannot be touched by man are family government, marriage at the center of that, family government, church government, and civil government. So I've made these distinctions, right? I've made these distinctions, but I'm not pretending that in the family, we get messages from God on Tuesday, and in the civil realm, we get messages from God on Friday, and then in the church, we get messages from God on Sunday. I've got no basis for saying that. What I know about God from the world, from natural revelation, from his word, from you know, what I know in my own heart, and in, uh, as uh, God has embedded his, um, his knowledge of himself in every human heart, uh, these things that I know, I know every day of the week. If I know it, I know it all the time. And if I don't know it, I don't know it any time. So here's the problem. Here are my questions. I've got uh, c- certain basic questions for adherence of the this R2K position. Assuming their distinction, the, their distinction and divide and separation between the civil magistrate and between the civil government and the ecclesiastical government, the civil realm and the ecclesiastical realm. Assuming that, here are my questions for people who are advocating that. Number one, and some of these questions, I'll I'll give you the numbers, but some of the questions are stacked questions. Number one, is there anything in the charter of each kingdom that prohibits cooperation, communication, and traffic with the other kingdom? Is there anything in the charter of each kingdom that says, you, you, know, you can't talk about that here. You've, you've got to go back to Sunday. You've got to go back to church. In other words, does natural law or natural revelation, I'm, I don't want to go too far down the wormhole here. I'm a, I'm a Vantillian. I, I'm much more comfortable with the, the term natural revelation, but God made the world the way he did. Um, and that reality is not optional. And it communicates truth to us which we suppress in unrighteousness, and it's the same truth that we're told in the Bible. So, um, does natural law reveal that we must not ever resort to special revelation? All right, so if the people in the civil realm are governing themselves by natural law, does natural law tell them, don't ever look in the Bible? Well, if it doesn't prohibit that, then why can't they? Why can't they go to the scriptures? And does special revelation ever say that we must never import specific and revealed content into the civil realm? On the church side, when they are, uh, when the minister is preparing his sermon in a society that is, let's say, racked by uh, race, racial strife, or um, let's say it's uh, 75 years ago in the Jim Crow era in the South, does a minister have a responsibility to preach to those civil conditions? I would, say, I would argue he does. But according to the R2K position, if he says, here's my text, and I'm saying something to you outside, you, you outsiders, what authority do I have for saying anything? So does special revelation ever say we must never import specific and revealed content from the scriptures into the civil realm? Can we ever go and say, thou shalt not? Thou shalt not. Like John the Baptist did with Herod. It's not lawful for you to have her. Why didn't Herod reply, John, you're blurring the edges of the two kingdoms, (laughs) right? Or the prophet Amos. The prophet Amos begins with a series of charges against the pagan nations around about Israel that didn't have special revelation. So he begins by saying, you do this, and you do this, and you do this. What? Where is he standing when he does this? So that's the first thing. Is there anything 
in the charter of either kingdom that prohibits us talking with each other. Can an emissary from this kingdom go over to that kingdom and say, hey, did you, have you learned anything? <laughs> Is there anything I can help you with? Sure, I, I have a word for you, for you, the preacher says. Yes, tell the magistrate I have a word for him from God. Why is that banned? Well, j just because you have the fact of the two kingdoms, why is the border between the two kingdoms sealed? Why can't we communicate across it? That's question number one. Number two, as God rules in the civil realm, does he require us to worship him? In the civil realm, are we required to worship him? If not, why not? If so, under what name and by what forms? Or, in this realm, is he satisfied with being the unknown god of the Athenians? Or, was an altar to him too much? When they built an altar to the unknown, is that too much? Are you presupposing he wants an altar? Is the god mentioned on American coinage the god of natural law and god we trust? Who is that? Does he have a son? Did his son die? Did his son rise from the dead? Do, do we have any business referring to him at all? According to R2K theology, uh, do we have an obligation? Does the, does the civil realm have an obligation to be agnostic? Because as soon as you say, no, no, we have an obligation to be theistic in the civil realm, so then you would say, so if we have a um, national worship service where we're worshiping the God of Abraham. No, I can't say that. Um, the God of the Great Spirit. That's it. The, the God of the First Nations. Um, do we get to do that? Or do we have to retreat to agnosticism? We No idea. No, no idea who we're talking about. Uh, and, and so we better not talk, we never, better not worship him at all. And if that's the case, then you've got the weird situation where God requires us to worship him in the church, in spirit and in truth, and requires us to do nothing of the kind in the civil realm. And, but if God communicates through natural law that we're not to kill each other and we're not to steal things, and uh, advocates of our 2K position would say, no, we know what the moral, um, our moral responses to God must be, does, the, does that moral response to God in the civil realm include acknowledgement of him? Does it include naming him? Does it include saying, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? And I think that they can't, given their, their commitments, I don't think they can say that. Number three, as God rules in the civil kingdom as creator and sustainer, does our human disobedience... Uh, does, does our human disobedience of the natural law also mean that he acts in, in his capacity as judge? Using the criteria of natural law alone, will God judge us for our abortion laws, for our same-sex mirages, and for our confis uh, confiscatory taxation? Will he, will he judge us for having larceny in our hearts when we elect legislators? Will he judge us for our bloodshed? Will he judge us for our abominations? Well, did he judge Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. And Jude tells us that he judged Sodom and Gomorrah so that we would have an example down to the end of the world of what God does to, to peoples like that, nations like that. So if God is ruling in the civil kingdom as creator and sustainer, and we are disobedient in the civil realm to that law that he gives, does God judge in that realm? Does God judge in that realm? And that leads directly to number four. If God can act as judge in the civil realm, and if you're acknowledging the presence of law in that realm and law breaking in that, in that realm, the, you have to have God judging. God has to, you know, it's his law that he communicated and we broke it. And does, does God come in as judge? So number four, if God can act as judge in the civil realm, is there any gospel or good news for those under judgment in this realm? 
if he does not act as judge in this realm, in what sense can he be said to be ruling? So, so if God says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, oh, never mind. If he's doing that, in what sense is he ruling? If he's the creator and sustainer, and he communicates to us his will, and we disobey that will, his holiness requires judgment. But if he judges, then the question is, are these people um, totally lost? Well, we say, yes, they're lost, but provisionally, because we have a gospel to preach to them. But if, but if they're staying in the civil realm, how is there any gospel that's even a possibility for them? Number five, if the reason for not bringing special revelation to bear in discussions about what to do in the civil realm is that unbelievers don't believe the Bible, what are we to do in those debates where they claim not to believe in natural law either? Okay, if I have to shut up because I bring out my Bible and I say, well, the scripture says, and say, you can't do that because I don't, I don't believe, I don't, I don't accept your sacred book. And we go red in the face and we put it, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> put it away. Uh, here's, here's an illustration of what we're doing. When we do that, this is what we're doing. It's not that I'm commending this form of activity, I'm just illustrating. Jesus... Jesus told parables with people being bad. Um, so here's, the, here's a parable. A man walks up to a man, puts a revolver in his um, back, and says, your money or your life. He's mugging him, robbing him. Your money or your life. This is Canada. A revolver is a small hand. <laughs> i hope I... Well, never mind. But, so your money or your life. And then the person being robbed says, you know, I'm, I'm sorry you're wasting your time. I don't, I don't believe in guns. And then if the mugger says, oh, I'm sorry, and puts it, <laughs> and puts it away, the problem is not that the muggy doesn't believe in guns. The problem is the mugger doesn't believe in guns. Okay, so when the non-believer says, you, don't, you can't use that Bible on me because I don't accept your Bible. And we put it away. The problem is not that he doesn't believe the Bible. The problem is that we don't believe the Bible. Right. Yeah. Right? So what, if someone says, well, I, you, it, you're saying all these things, and, and I, don't believe, I don't accept what you're saying in your book, we should say, well, it's funny you should say that because it says here in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 1 that this is exactly the way you would go, the, exactly what you would say. <laughs> You, you, don't, you don't need the non-believer's permission to use the Word of God on him. Uh, the Word of God, is says, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a weapon, and it, it, it <coughs> takes care of us. We, are not, we do not sit in judgment on God's Word. God's Word judges us. And if we accept, but if we accept that the, the fact that non-believers can totally spike our guns when we're talking about special revelation... The question is, why can't they do that with natural revelation? Why can't they say, I don't accept your natural law tradition. I don't accept your natural revelation arguments. I don't accept that uh, Darwin, man, everybody, everybody who's not an idiot knows that Darwin solved all of this for us. We are, the, uh, we are the end product of time and chance acting on matter, and you religious fanatics just have to go away. Why, can't, why, why isn't that authoritative also? Over us, well, you you should notice that that's precisely what's happening in our our debates in the civil realm. Christians are being told to. We were told uh, decades ago to shut up about the Bible, and now we're being told to shut up about everything. Okay, you can't talk at all. You have nothing to say to us, and anything you might want to say to us from this different perspective is going to be considered by us as a hate crime. So, what do we do in those debates where they claim not to believe in natural law either? If their denials and unbelief do not cause us to set aside natural revelation, then why should their denials and unbelief be the cause for us to set aside the Scriptures? So, what I want to argue here is that 
is fine with me that if, if we make distinctions between ecclesiastical government and civil government and family government. It's, it's a good, those are, that's a good set of distinctions to make, and I believe that they are biblical distinctions to make. A father is not an elder in a church. Being an officer in one government doesn't make you an officer in another government. And being an elder in a church doesn't make you a member of parliament. Being a member of parliament doesn't make you a father. It, it, these, these offices don't transfer, and they're distinct governments, and they have distinct um, laws and bylaws and ways of operating. So the distinctions are fine. But if you start arguing, if you start saying that um, just because I have described a particular government, so the civil realm, and said, and the thing that's in charge of this civil realm is natural law, that the boundaries are not porous at all, they're absolutely watertight, and they can't leak into any other realm of life, my, my question is, where do we get that part? So the plausibility of the R2K position is that they're pointing to ecclesiastical and civil realms, which really are distinct governments. They, they really are distinct governments. And so far, I agree with them and would simply want to add the family. But when I go from the realm of the family to church, if I'm uh, making a decision in our family, and then I go to an elders meeting and I'm making a decision in the elders meeting and I go to um, vote in an election later that day, what is that? That's height, breadth, and depth. That's me doing three different things in three different areas. And I can distinguish them easily. But if I, if I took one of them away, I've got a flat lectern. I, I, have, no, I have no lectern at all. I can't take my fatherhood away and just function as an elder and as a citizen. Or I can't, just, I can't take my citizenship away and just function as a father. I have to remember who I am because, as the sage once said, wherever you go, there you are. Right? And everything that you are comes with you. Everything that you are comes with you. So consequently, I think this whole thing is... Um, too facile and too easy, and it gets its uh, central virtue is that it gets us off the hook. And there's a um, philosopher, not not a Christian gent, but he he uh, wrote an he wrote a book that has a, um, a very striking argument in it and a wonderful phrase, which is the title of the book, which ex explains what I think is going on. The title of the book is Retreat to Commitment. Retreat to Commitment. What this is, is the phenomenon of um, surrendering in all essential respects and acting as though you're preserving something, acting like you're protecting something when you're actually running away, okay? So you retreat to commitment. Uh, someone says, do you believe that we ought not to take the lives of unborn children? And you, if, you start if you start hearing yourself say or hear people around you say, well, in our faith tradition, what is that? That's a retreat to commitment. We believe these things. We believe that human life is sacred inside our four walls. Right? Inside, inside the realm of our faith tradition, um, this is the way it is. So we retreat to our little enclave and beat our chests as though we really believe, you know, we retreat to this area of commitment because that retreat will ensure that we don't collide with the forces of evil. Um, because if we collide with the forces of evil, that might cost us something. We might risk the, the, the folly of martyrdom. We might risk having something go bad, something go wrong uh, with us. We might find ourselves in some sort of, uh, some sort of conflict. So when someone says, so you Christians... Uh, the problem, you, and t t I'll take the pro-life e example as a, as a, as one I think that resonates with all of us. You Christians are trying to impose your morality on non-believers. I say absolutely. Of course. What else would I? What else would I impose? <laughs> I don't want to impose immorality on unbelievers. <laughs> They're already doing fine. 
<laughs> and why would I why would I impose what other people think on people? If if we're so all laws, by definition, all laws are coercive. Just by definition. Laws are necessarily coercive. So you introduce what is uh, what Rush Dooney called the inescapable concept. It's not whether, but which. It's not whether there's going to be imposed morality, it's which morality will be imposed. Not whether, but which. So when they say, you, you're just trying to impose morality on us, I say, yes, absolutely. And you're trying to do the same thing. Okay, it's it's inescapable. If you're if you're in, involved in the public square at all, you're advocating that somebody impose on somebody. Right? If you're if the only way to escape this is to run off into the woods and live in a Unabomber cabin, right? and just live there uh, roots and berries, and you now you're not imposing on anybody. Uh, but if you advocate for any kind of Society, society being configured in a particular way, you are advocating for the imposition or the coercion of some people by other people. And the fundamental question always comes back, by what standard? By what standard are we going to do this? So if they say, are you wanting to impose on, uh, you're trying to impose Christian morality on the doctor who's going to perform the abortion and on the mother who's trying to procure an abortion? I'd say, yes, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to stop what's going to happen later today, and I want to stop it by means of the law. That's, what I want. That's why I want it to be against the law. This is what I want to do. And you guys want the doctor and the mother to impose their morality on the child. Okay? You want to impose your morality on the child. I want to impose God's morality on you and the mother, and in the morality that I am arguing should be imposed, nobody dies. Or as I, was, I just mentioned this the other day, and someone uh, added a, a, a very uh, good foundational underpinning to that. No, correction, in the Christian morality, somebody dies, but it was 2,000 years ago, right? It was 2,000 years ago, and that's the foundation of his authority. So. Let's, uh, let me uh, bring this in for a landing with this. Jesus said, what, what are our marching orders in the church? What are we told to do? Why doesn't God just get us saved and whisk us off to heaven as soon as we're saved? What, why, what, does he have, what, what are we here for? What are we here for? Well, the marching orders of the church are found in the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Now, what does that do to two kingdoms? It says, whatever kingdom it is, I'm the king of it. Whatever kingdom it is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go disciple the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. That's, what we're, that's why we're here. That's what we're here for. Our job, our task, is fundamentally birth and growth. Right? We birth baptizing them, bringing them to Christ, faith in Christ, and then growth, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Now, who are the them? Well, it's ethnoi. It's the tribes. It's the nations. So, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, disciple the nations. That means Jesus Christ commanded Christians in Canada to have as the direct object of all their missionary endeavor the evangelization and conversion of Canada. So the, the goal is for Canada to become Christian. And if you know your history, for Canada to become Christian again. Right? To, for Canada to repent of the way it's gone and return to Christ. America, the same thing. Mexico, the same thing. Argentina, the same thing. China, the same thing. We're calling the nations to repentance. And there is no way to keep a nice and tidy division going between the sins that they're committing in the civil realm. When I go to preach the gospel to, you know, as when, when Paul is uh, giving his testimony to King Agrippa and he, you know, you're trying to persuade me to become a Christian, Paul says, well, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish that everyone were the way I am except for these chains. Uh, I, yes, I want you to become like I am. So when you're, when, if you have an opportunity to present the gospel to the uh, uh, Chinese dictator or to uh, North, to Kim Jong-un or to uh, the president or your prime minister, when you present the gospel, where are you standing? Well, you're standing on the word of God. <laughs> That's where, you're standing on the word of God, however it, exp- however it comes to us and however, uh, whatever recollections of that word uh, the person you're speaking to has it from. It's all, it's all part of an integrated whole. We can distinguish, but we must not separate. Uh, we, we can distinguish, and we, and we shouldn't separate because we don't have the ability to separate these things without slaughtering them, without uh, maiming them, without wrecking the whole thing, which is what I think the R2K uh, position winds up doing. It it's simply creates a profound theological schizophrenia that, that cripples you when you try to say anything about anything and you're trying to wonder, you're trying to figure out, well, what hat am I wearing? What hat is he wearing? Where, what day of the week is this? You're just lost. And the, and the end result is you're going to wind up saying nothing at all. You're going to wind up saying nothing at all. And our age needs a, the church to recover its prophetic voice like we uh, we need f- a few other things more than that right we the church needs to recover its prophetic voice and it's not going to, we're not going to recover it until it's a unified voice and it's not going to be that's not it's not going to be unified until we understand a theology that unifies the old testament and the new that unifies uh, family government church government and civil government that understands that all of this is brought together and coheres together in christ